two artists bonded for life by a mutual enthusiasm for the finer things like philosophy, big butts, and raggedy punk boys. Please welcome Janelle and Bronte. I actually totally hate public speaking, and my nightmare is to follow somebody like Paul Flores. <laughs> if I thought I could get away with doing like a little ham puppet show up here, I would have done that. Um, Okay, but as Michelle said, I recently illustrated and published a book called The Cruising Diaries. And it's uh, Brontes' memoir of sexual escapades around the Bay Area. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna tell a story about a date that I went on somewhat recently and um, start off pretty normal. We're like eating Thai food in Berkeley and towards the end of the date, uh, my uh, date, his name is Tony. <laughs> he uh, started working his mouth around, like maybe he was like trying to get something off of his gums, and he pulls out this huge hunk of just like something sharp and hard and metal, like we didn't know what it was, and he'd almost swallowed it. It was like giant. So he calls the waitress over, she comes over. He's like, hey, yeah, I found this in my food, I almost swallowed it. She grabs it in her bare hands after it had been in his mouth, uh, is examining it with her like thumb and forefinger, doing a little CSI forensic investigation. And then she says, huh, looks like a piece of broken plate. And then just leaves and she doesn't apologize. <laughs> like she just thought the end and like walked away. So <laughs> ordinarily if this had happened to you, you know, you'd be like upset. Maybe you'd call the manager over, like write a bad Yelp review, you know, maybe just like dine and dash. Um, but Tony just, Tony got real quiet, he got real quiet, and, <laughs> and he went to the bathroom. And he was gone a while, and I figured he would just like, needed some space to himself, and was like, maybe fuming and pulling himself together. Until I got a text, and the text said, <laughs> get ready to leave right when I get out of here. I'm like, huh, how come? I text him back, and he says, I just took a shit on the floor. <laughs> And this guy was always like, he was a funny guy, right? He's always pulling these pranks on me. I'm like, this jokester. And I'm like, yeah, right, you're lying. And then I got a picture text. <laughs> and then there was like no denying. Exhibit A, like lying there, like sleepily curled up on the floor, little brown log on white tile. It was not CGI, it was doo-doo, it was on the floor. <laughs> Who does that? So he's 40 years old, by the way. I wasn't like on a date with a 16 years old. This is a 40 year old man's problem solving skills. Uh, and in case you ever wondered if I'm a ride or die type of woman, I'm not. <laughs> I texted him back, I'll be waiting in the car and I just fled the scene. <clears throat> so this isn't like a story like, remember that one crazy guy I went out that one time? No, I dated him for a year after that. <laughs> And guess what, I was never ever bored. I was never bored. So I published a lot of fanzines, like a lot of punk fanzines when I was younger, and they had a lot of dating stories in them. And punk dating stories are messy. Barf happens, windshields get kicked out. Once someone notoriously, famously got a bucket of rancid piss dumped on his head. Um, but it was never my intention to like shame anyone. I was just trying to chronicle my adventures of like being a sexual Charlie Brown that always got the football yanked away. <laughs> and as I got older, um, I got kind of concerned that what it meant to turn human beings into anecdotes and maybe if it was damaging my friendships. And I had a lot of time to mull this over and I've decided, fuck that. My grand, <laughs> my grand conclusion is if you have a story to tell, um, you have an obligation to tell it. If it's a funny story or it can like help humanity in some way, <laughs> you need to tell your story because we live in very boring times. <laughs> Technology has made people lazy and pa passive. Companies take our creativity, you know, dilute it, regurgitate it back to us in like a boring new package. Um, reading internet comments make you stupid and they give you ass cancer, you should just stop doing it. It's like a terrible thing to do. And so, for all these reasons and more, that's why I decided to publish The Cruising Diaries. Um, I truly believe that stories about poop dick and fisting can make the world a brighter place. 
and <laughs> and I also think that <laughs> no, there's one more thing. I feel like there's an underlying message there about the clumsiness and the sweetness and the futility of seeking out human connection that we can all relate to. And I think that it's great. And so without further ado, here's Brontes. <laughs> So um, these were all stories, oh, yeah. So these were all stories called from this um, fanzine I did um, about 10 years ago called Fag School. Um, I'm, I grew up in Alabama, and um, I kind of internet stalked Janelle about 15 years ago. I knew her as the lady on the cover of uh, the Bratmobile record. <laughs> and um, also did Tells a Blarg, a zine I was, well, I never saw Tales of Blog, I saw uh, Desperate Times, but I was always um, pretty enamored. Cut to later, moved to Oakland, um, and we're friends, yay! And she put out this fucking crazy shit. Um, anyway, so I moved here, and I was finally just like, I was happy to be out of Alabama, and I was just like, yeah, I live in the city, I can get some dick. <laughs> um, and so I wrote some stories about it. Okay, um, hold on, um, this first story is a, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, wait, wait, good. This um, first story is a tale of the supernatural. <laughs> <clears throat> I woke up alone to that weird pulsating butthole feeling, like when you're getting fucked and someone pulls their dick out of your ass and there's that weird sort of pop or whatever. Has anyone ever had ass sex and that happened? Oh yeah, I'm the only one, you fucking liars. <laughs> Anyway, I felt that feeling waking up and I did a quick finger check to see if I had shit myself. When I noticed that I was clean, a chill of terror ran down my spine as I looked across the empty room. I had totally been fucked by a ghost. Oh. <laughs> this next story is entitled Taco Truck. <laughs> um, I used to have a big problem with drinking. Um, now I'm just a sex addict. Taco truck. <laughs> <laughs> I was standing in line at the cafe waiting for my bagel when my recollection of the night before, which had somehow escaped me all morning. You know how that happens, like the next day, you like, you're just like, oh man, I did that shit. <laughs> Fuck. Anyway, came snapping back and shit fuck Jesus Mary, what a doozy. Bits and pieces came together. After the beer bust at the Eagle, I went to the hotel room of a very short, dark Asian porn star. No sex, he just wanted to be friends, weak. I stole some of his underwear and left. That was Darren, by the way, yeah. <laughs> On the tra oh, is this recording? <laughs> Damn. Anyway, on the train back home, I looked at my balls falling out of my jogging shorts. If I wasn't me, would I want to gay bash me? Probably. I got off at my stop, and that buff meth head was asking me for change again. He was really feeling it and followed me all the way to the taco truck. He refused to let up, so after some shrewd negotiation, I paid him $2 to suck his dick behind the taco truck at the far end of the parking lot. His dick tasted like coffee. After remembering all of this, I started crying and calling my big brother. I called my big brother and started pulling all that whiny, where is my life going bullshit? Luckily, he set me straight and explained his reasoning in three parts. One, don't trip about blowing a drug addict. There is no bigger understatement than homelessness sucks. If you were homeless, you would want hella drugs too. True. Two. Not having sex with someone just because they don't have a house is discrimination. <laughs> Do you really want that on your consciousness? Don't be a dick. Let it slide. Three, and this is the most important point. 
Besides richer parents and the whole hygiene thing, what makes those soulless cokehead art school losers you scramble to fuck more sexually credible than the homeless guy? I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> Seeing it this way made me feel better and that buff myth head, or my lover rather, stopped asking me for change and started flirting with me more because I guess I give good head. I was so pleased with all the positive outcomes of this scenario, I was even inspired to stop drinking for a week. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so when I first moved here, I used to, um, I lived in this like crazy punk rock warehouse in East Oakland with like 25 other kids. <laughs> That's why I am who I am. Like I'll be like at work or at school like talking to myself and shit, like just damaged as fuck, like. God, it was like the best time of my life. <clears throat> the story is called Brenda's Revenge. Okay, one time I had a really hot roommate who did tons of cocaine. One night, for like the 48th time ever, I was in his room getting fucked up and helping him look for drugs he had lost when three tequila shots later, as if by magic, we were slapping dicks. He turns on straight porn and asks if he can call me Brenda, the name of his favorite girl in the porno. <laughs> At this point, I was too far along in the process. Fuck it, why not try it once? Um, sure, dude, whatever. Then he tried to fuck me without a condom. Listen, baby, I don't have AIDS. I only have sex with girls, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, keep talking, genius. No condom, ew. I was younger then. Um, <laughs> If he had been my steady monogamous boyfriend or Damon from the, from the British pop band Blur, this scene could have been more negotiable. But this fucking cokehead, aw, oh, hell no. Nah. He wasn't gonna get me pregnant. <laughs> the thought of a cauliflower farm growing in my ass, as well as a super powerful STD dragon that would also live in my ass and harass me in my sleep at night came to mind, cause I was high, and I was moved to action. Put on a condom, you fucking hippie. <laughs> he put on a condom, immediately lost his erection, and passed out. <laughs> this was quite some bullshit. Boning, <laughs> <laughs> Boning down with cokehead straight dudes is counter-revolutionary, and he didn't even have the decency to give me a fucking bump. <laughs> that motherfucker. I eased the tension by coming really quick, quickly, wiping my cum on one of his clean pair of socks and leaving the room. <laughs> um, this, is, this is back when I was a student at Laney College. Sometimes I just go and hang out at the locker room. I haven't <laughs> gone there in years. Um, <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> locker room. I took a ballet class and I was fucking horrible. My teacher was a groundbreaking 80-year-old artist who had survived multiple heart surgeries and danced in the last days of Oakland vaudeville. She told me that I had potential. She also told me to study the Mexican dancers. Watch their technique, she said. It's something about their technique. Juan introduced himself after class, and I followed him to the locker room where he undid my belt, pulled down my pants, gently turned me face first into the lockers, and pulled my hips back so my ass was more exposed in the corridor of locker compartments. He rubbed saliva on his dick and tried to enter me, but I told him no. Again, I was young. He physically insisted in this sort of way, and I didn't tell him no the second time, but I was too tense. I knew something more reasonable was gonna have to happen, so I sucked him off, and he came in my mouth and on my chest. We cleaned up just in time before the dumb baseball players stormed the locker room. I never saw him again after that. <laughs> there were more wands. <laughs> I swear there was more. Oh, this dude. <laughs> I ended up in LA at this party with a totally famous gay rapper. This fat kid kicked me out of a three-way and then I started receiving somewhat unwanted advances from one of the rapper's friends. I guess I flirted with him a bit before and he took it really seriously. He grabbed me, refused to let me go, and repeated over and over in this really thick LA cholo accent, don't be fucked up, don't be fucked up, don't be fucked up. I wasn't gonna fool around with him, but then I relently, partly because I don't know why and partly because I was mildly curious, and also I was there, why not? 
We got to the bathroom and he wanted to fuck me, but I told him that he could come on my face and that was it. Though, <laughs> though I felt like I had worked hard to make this situation a mutually loving and erotic experience for both of us, he still told all his friends at the party that I was a stuck up bitch. <laughs> and I am. The fuck, what the fuck? I could have just bent over. What the fuck? Kind. So precious. <laughs> This story is called Shrooms. <clears throat> it was Sunday morning and I was in Dolores Park getting ridiculously baked with a bunch of lady men. A very boastful friend was feeling high and mighty because he was the only practicing fist fucker amongst us. This means fist fucker. <laughs> it's a universal symbol for fist -ing. Okay. <clears throat> It's the most powerful connection you will ever feel with anyone ever, she said, as if sharing a favorite TV show or flavor of ice cream didn't count. Really, bitch? Lies. I told my side of the story. Some time ago, I was feeling grandiose and took all the shroom caps in an eighth bag of mushrooms and went to the bathhouse by myself. A very handsome older gentleman asked me if I was into handballing. I told him that it wasn't my cup of tea, but I'd take a sip, and that I was tripping balls. <laughs> he told me that I'd be fine, and he gave me a gold star because my fingers were freshly manicured. I took him in his room and started to punch him in the ass real good. And then I got triggered into thinking about that old video game, Mortal Kombat, and that voice that comes on when your partner is at his most vulnerable that yells, finish him. And then I rip his guts out and hold him up to the air, mystic thunder crashing down around me because holy shit, I was fucking high. And then it occurred to me that I was kind of bored and would rather be getting fucked because I'm a lazy bottom. The most powerful connection you will feel with anyone ever, my ass. Besides his heartbeat, I felt nothing. <laughs> because when you fist someone, you can feel their heartbeat. That weird vein is right there, and it's like doo doo, doo doo, doo doo, doo doo, doo doo. You didn't know that? It's crazy. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Janelle Hessig and Brontes Pinnell. Holy God. Okay, like crying.